I'm going to talk today just about giving. And then next week I'm going to talk about tithing. And we're kind of on a theme uh, of just belonging, your church membership. And, and this isn't a membership drive. We will probably have a membership class. We haven't had one for a number of months. And some of you may want to officially uh, join the church. But we're just talking about belonging. And I had this acronym that I talked about last week, ACT. Uh, attendance or attachment is the A, C is the collection, which just basically takes in giving, uh, and then T uh, deals with task, A-C-T, task and whatever God would have you do, because we all have a ministry, but when I think about that A, attachment, Stephanie and I had to run down to uh, Palm Springs, uh, actually Indian Wells, right outside of Palm Springs, and she had a, just a one-day conference on Wednesday, we drove down and, um, and then we, it was just like a 24-hour thing. And we uh, got checked into the Hyatt. And it's, it's beautiful. And uh, I had this key. They gave you a key. In the higher class uh, places where you stay, put it, put it in a little envelope. In four, we were in 4216. So anyway, Stephanie had to attend a class. We check in at noon. And we have this absolutely beautiful, luxurious room on two levels came in and you know there was one level where the, the, there was a bathroom with two doors like Loretta Young used to open <laughs> if you go back that far and uh, big big old bathroom and uh, and then uh, they had the, the bed and this beautiful huge screen TV on the one level and then you went down a couple steps and then they had like a seating area and I went out to a balcony and just looked at these beautiful grounds. You know, it's the middle of the desert, just like here in Las Vegas, but just these lush, beautiful grounds. And so I, I just kept thinking, God, what a privilege it is to experience. You know, we need beauty in our lives. We have times where we need beauty. You know, these kind of places are probably four and five hundred dollars a night. And Stephanie and I could splurge and go to one of those, but we uh, more than likely will go to a day's inn where you, for that price you can stay for four or five days. You know what I mean? It's, it's nice. But, but the blessing was that I got to enjoy this, this, uh, these beautiful grounds and just pampering and luxury and it didn't cost me a nickel. All I had to do, I had this key that got me into the room, got me into the parking lot. Just, I was like power, you know. And it's, the reason I had the key is because of, of uh, who I was related to, Stephanie. I used to get these privileges when I was in show business. We'd do a convention and get all these frou-frou things with uh, uh, corporations and things. But uh, now that I'm not in show business anymore, ministry doesn't usually hand these things to you. But I got... I got this access through my wife. And, and so th the access we have into the church, it's that same privilege. You know, if, if we don't realize what a privilege it is to belong to the church, there are privileges of belong. It's, it's a privilege and the privilege not only of belonging and being in this family, flawed as we are, but also the responsibilities, which are also a privilege. And we'll talk about that. But yeah, this is okay. In fact, I am hanging on to this because you know, I may be back in that area and I may want to go to that room again. So I'm just going to keep this. Got the key, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk today about how giving is living. Giving is living. And life in Christ is all about giving. It's about two things. Forgiving, right? When we come to Jesus, we understand that our need of forgiveness and forgiving. And so our whole lives are based on, on that, that, that phrase. Because, you know, we will spend the rest of our lives, as long as God has us here, after, he, after we're born again, uh, in need of forgiving people constantly, you know. If you thought, you know, it's over, no. <laughs> It just goes on and on, having to deal with it and not feeling like forgiving and having to forgiving. But God is also for giving, two separate words, you know. He's a giving God. And it's, it's a great, great privilege to, to give. And often when people think, oh, the church is going to talk about money or giving, uh, if, if, you're not, if your mind is not in the right place with God, you just thought, oh, here we go again. They're always asking for money. I used to hate when I was single and I'd show up for church and they would have the husbands love your wives sermon and I'd think, I should have slept in today. Yeah. <laughs> and the tithing sermon. Yeah. 
two of my least favorites. But I, I was, my mind was in a different place. But the thing is, you know, we, we were on this theme of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And that just runs through the Bible. And that's the, just the basis of our lives, that we're to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, with everything in us. And when we love God that way, we want to give. Just the way it is. When you love anybody, you want to give. And it's a glorious mystery that we are in partnership with God. That's a mystery, the way, the way God uses you and me to do his work. When Jesus was on earth and he was in the a bodily form and he showed us what God looks like and what God does in a body. And then he left the earth and he told his disciples, wait until the Holy Spirit comes so that we would be filled with the spirit of Jesus to do what Jesus uh, would do until he returns. And it's a mystery that he trusts us to, as Rick was saying with his friend, Jimbo, to share the gospel because he could send angels to do that. But he uses broken vessels. It's like people say, uh, when we share the gospel, it's like one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. I remember Dick Johnson used to say that all the time. So it's, again, uh, we're his body. And sometimes he has our feet uh, go where we need to go. We'll to go visit Pam, go visit the sick, uh, go visit the dying, as far as we know, unless God does a miracle and raises her up. Go visit prisoners, as Tim does. Sometimes he uses our mouths to speak encouragement to someone or to bring hope to somebody who feels hopeless. And he uses our hands all the time. People go on mission trips and they build houses in Mexico and uh, various uh, places or, or our hands to feed the hungry in, in ministries here in the city. So he has all the riches of heaven available. And he owns, as the scripture says, the cattle on a thousand hills. Yeah, that's hard for us to grasp because, you know, it's better to just say he's got more money than God. <laughs> oh, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but, you know, billionaire, you know. And he has a, but he, as Rick was sharing, he, he gives us, gives to us, and then we're to use a portion. Now, uh, Rick was sharing what he said, uh, uh, one of those uh, verses in Proverbs, and I want to look at that quickly. Proverbs 3, 5 through 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is one of my favorite scriptures. And do not lean on your own understanding. Yeah. Most of our lives, every day we walk with the Lord is a trust test. Sometimes the trust tests seem more severe than other times. If you lose a job and you're out of work a while, yeah. it's, it, it's a trust test. I used to love when Joyce Meyer would talk about those trust tests and she'd say, if you fail it, don't worry, God will give you a chance to take it again. And I remember being out of work one year with that teaching and ringing in my ears, and I thought, God, I want to get this, I want to pass this test because I really don't want to go through this a whole lot of other times, you know. <laughs> so you, you, you get the makeup test in these things of trust. We're constantly learning to trust God, and as they also say, it's always an open book test. <laughs> Only one person got that, but thank you, Rick, for acknowledging <laughs> that you got it. So trust in the Lord. So that's where it begins, trust, uh, trust in God. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. That's just always bringing God into every situation in life. It says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Boy, that's a tough one, because we all think we're pretty smart. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And then what Rick was sharing, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first fruits of all your crops. Now, I don't know. I don't raise beans or potatoes. But my crops are my bank account, things that God gives me. Then your barns will be filled with to overflowing, your vats will brim over with new wine. So basically, the reason we talk about giving is, is not so much that we need it. And I'm going to make this statement this week, and I'm going to make it next week when it comes to tithing. We have, over the year, with, with a small group of people, even now we're not a very big church, but we have never had a financial problem. And it's because of the people who give in whatever form that is. 
15%, 6%, whatever. But it's because, and, and I know when we had 25 people and we had 35 and now we have generally 70 some in a service, that not everybody's tithing. Some people aren't giving anything, probably. And be aware that I don't know what any of you give and I never will. I have no desire to know what anybody gives because when I speak to you, I don't want to be influenced by how much or how little you're giving. I have no clue because the widow put in two mites and it was more than anybody else gave. So if the standards are different, God knows. It's between you and God. But the reason we've been sustained is because of givers. Givers. And again, not everybody in any church is tithing. So it's between you and God and letting God speak to your heart on these things. But the reason we want to talk about giving is, is not because, and you know if you've been in this church that I am not saying give till it hurts or just want to shake you by the ankles and let all the coins drop out for, you know. It's to be blessed. It, you will never know the fullness of life in God until you learn to give. And it's, and it's not having to give, uh, you know, just like empty your bank account. But, but God knows each person's heart and each, what, pe what people can give. He knows that. So uh, Acts 20, 20, 35 says this, remembering the words Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You get more blessing giving away than when Santa Claus comes down your chimney. Oprah had more blessing going, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car than those people who got those cars years back, you know? When I was young, I guess I was about 21. We just, my sister and brother and I had just come to town. We had been uh, in the entertainment field for several years, and we began to work right away at the Landmark Hotel. And after being there a few months, uh, sporadically, we got uh, a six-month contract with the show that used to be in town, the Mickey Finn Show. And then that contract ended, and we were out of work for a few months. So we were getting our taste of what it was to be in show business. Uh, sometimes it's plenty, and sometimes you're just waiting for the next gig, as they say. So I remember my sister was dating this guy, and uh, he was going to the, taking her to a movie uh, in the uh, matinee. And he invited my brother and me to go because we, you know, didn't want to spend money on movies when you're uh, broke, you know, you're trying to hang on to every nickel, you know what I mean? And I remember it was, you know, I'm only 21 years old. I hadn't been supporting myself very long, probably nine months, you know, paying my rent and those sort of things, you know, that mom and dad weren't doing it anymore. But, you know, it was, it was humiliating. I, I thought, I want to be the one I went to the movies, I don't remember what movie it was, but I just remember that, that, that feeling of, I would much rather be the person opening my wallet and paying for the thing. Now, having said that, there are times when you have to learn to receive, and that takes humility, because you will, you will keep someone from having a blessing if they want to help you in some way. Uh, that's a blessing for them to, so sometimes we have to suck it up. <laughs> But I'll tell you, I, I love that I'm in a position today to be able to bless people with what I have. So, I have to applaud this church for the way you have given. And again, I don't know who gives what, or, but, but various times we take up special offerings. And it's amazing in a smaller church. I, I know that the, the Women's Resource Center, it got back to me, that they said that, that we are the most giving small church of all the ministries they have in town. They have big churches and big, big offerings, but for a church our size, we give. I think one time my niece, Brittany, several years back called, and um, she had friends she had gone to high school with, a young married couple, and they had lost their first child, uh, their baby, baby, eight months old, this little baby had died. And she called me just before church and said, Uncle Bill, could, could your church do something? Could you help them out for, you know, with funeral expenses and things like that? And we, we took up just a, you know, a last minute offering and, and I wrote this down. We, we took in $230 for that couple. People we didn't even know, but we blessed. The giving is so sweet. I could go on and on about the ways and, uh, this church has fed into various ministries here in Las Vegas and around the world. Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Living is giving. 
And some of you, as you listen to this, you don't, you know, you, you're givers. And you're just, it's just encouraging you. It's like a pat on the back and you're going, yay, 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 yay. But there'll always be people that struggle when we're talking about giving. And uh, like Rick was saying, initially, you know, he, when he was coming to tithing, he gave 4% and increased it and increased it and got up to 10 and beyond. And, you know, sometimes it just takes a while. And God's fine with that because God knows our hearts. But we need to learn uh, that giving is living. And, you know, we've had people in here have, that have, in the church that have been in need. And they come in and we help them, uh, people that are even members of the church. And we'll help them with this situation, this situation. I remember that we had a young lady. I know everybody knows who I'm talking about. But she had a couple of children. She came up to me the first week she was here, tears in her eyes. She said, I'm so embarrassed. I'm on government assistance. And I want to get off of it. And she had a baby and she had a teenage girl. She had the baby out of wedlock to somebody. So anyway, we had helped her various times paying her power bill. We don't know why she didn't pay it, but we couldn't let the children, the baby, go uh, in the middle of winter in a, a place that wasn't heated. So, uh, but you know, those kind of situations, people are under a curse of poverty. And many times people grow up on government assistance. Now, there are times when that might be fine. But it creates, at times, uh, an, an issue, a, a give me, a help me. Uh, and we're not created to be that way. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, there'll be situations, again, where somebody has health problems and there's no way. And the Bible, even in the Old Testament, had uh, provisions for the, for the church, the Israelites, to help those in those situations. But there can be a spirit of poverty that comes on people because they've got their hands out, give me, and they have them clinched. They won't let go. They don't know how to give. And so that law of reciprocity, which we'll talk about, is not in action in their lives. So you don't want to be a hoarder or live. It's bondage to live in fear of deprivation by giving away. And if you don't think that people are basically stingy, you should have been at Costco on Thursday with me. I had no, I, I'm just living my life. I'm not living in fear over this coronavirus. We can be cautious, you know, let's be smart, not be stupid about it. But I go to Costco, I, there's a line of, I never saw so many cars coming, coming out and then I could hardly get through the parking lot because people were, are pushing their car. I thought, what's going on here? It, it didn't register and I got in there and I see everybody with their water. And then I called my uh, Stephanie, and she was talking about this, this toilet paper uh, thing. People are afraid that they won't be able to wipe in case there's a quarantine. You know, well, what would happen if you were quarantined a long time and that last little piece of toilet paper is gone? What are you going to do? So I go back where the towels, paper towels, there's not a paper product to be found, and these people are all gathered in those great big Hummer carts that they have there, trying to get the water, you know. <sighs> Maya Angelou <laughs> said this, I have found that among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. <sighs> that is so true. It liberates the soul. Giving is a natural response to love. And God is love and God gives. And I love when we look at John 3.16. We all know three, John 3.16, most of us frontwards and backwards. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave. That's the giver. And what did he give? His only son. The most precious, valuable thing for people who would spit in his face. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He doesn't change when it comes to giving. God's a giver. And God is so loving and so giving that he even gives, as I mentioned, to, to the people who would pluck out his beard spit in his face, have no room for him, he still gives. Matthew 5, uh, 44 and 45. 
says this, but I tell you, and, th and this people, this is so, I, I, I don't have this one down, to be honest, yet, fully. But I tell you, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. People, that can only be done by the power of God. You cannot in yourself do that. I can't do it. You have to just lay yourself before God and say, God, I have no ability to do this. And it says, to do that, that, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Even the bad kids, God's taking care of them. And, and it's sad that when people don't respond to that love. But they don't, and they won't. Real quickly, I'm going to look at a few verses in Nehemiah. Look at how God gave to his people Israel. What, did, what he did for Israel as a nation, he does for us as individuals. Just quickly, we'll go through a few of these verses in Nehemiah 9, starting in verse 13. It says, you came down, speaking to God, on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that were just and right and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands. How many times the word give, gave is given here? Decrees and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger you gave them bread from heaven. And in their thirst you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go and take possession of the land. You had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. In spite of that they rebelled. We pick up in verse 19. Because of your great compassion you did not abandon them in the desert. By day the pillar of cloud did not cease to guide them in their path. Nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. We'll just stop there to just say... God is, is their everything, and he's our everything, and he's going to take care of us. And he wants us to follow in that path of generosity and giving. When we read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, and this is such a great time of year as we move into, uh, as we're going through this Lenten season, however you may celebrate it, and as we move toward Easter each year, we just look at Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and we just see everything Jesus did. He was, we always say he, he gave his life. We think of when he, we talk about Jesus giving, he gave his life on the cross. But every, every move he made was a move of giving. He was healing. He was feeding. He was touching. He was spending time with. He, he, was, he, he gave himself, every part of himself, to the human race. And he's basically asking us to do the same thing. You know, the most joyous people I know are just giving people, however they may give. Sometimes it's people who are giving, uh, because when we talk about giving, it's, and, and it ties in with when we talk about what you do in the church, what people are able to do, uh, and that's a ministry. Uh, but I think about people that are part of Unity Prayer, uh, Pat and Gary, and they go to Sri Lanka and India uh, a few times a year, and, and they help uh, what they do is they bring used glasses from the United States, eyeglasses. And they, because uh, people there have nothing, and, and they you know, try to fit them with the prescription. They have a certain way, but, but they go, and they, they just, it's such a joy for them. They go for months. Now, I don't know about you, but my idea of a good time is not going to Sri Lanka, not going to India. Now, God, could, God can put that in our hearts, and then it becomes a joy. But, but the idea of like eating, you know, what do you mean there's not a five guys anywhere for 5,000 miles, you know? You know, that's, but these people come back with such joy, they, but, and that's a giving, it's a giving, joy is giving, giving is living. Now, let's look at 2 Corinthians 8, 7. Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us. See also that you excel in the grace of giving. Excel in the grace of, of giving. Not only because it blesses other people, but because it's going to bless you as well. And God wants his people blessed. Now, for anybody in here, because you all look, I'm looking at your faces, you all look like, very generous people. And look, I, I just can't see anybody. I'm not seeing an expression on anybody's face that looks like they're really struggling with this or resisting. Yeah. But maybe you're faking. You know. 
But let's go to 1 Kings. If you have your Bible, I'm going to actually give you a few minutes or a few seconds to turn to that. 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, starting in the seventh verse. We're going to look at, a lot of you may know this story. It's about the widow of Zarephath. 1 Kings 17, starting in verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Elijah pronounced a, a drought, people, on King Ahab. There was sin in the land, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years. And so now there's a famine because no rain, no crops. Judgment. Don't think that there are times when we look at things that go on in this planet that God's hand of judgment isn't involved. Even this coronavirus, even that tornado. Now, I don't know. There's a lot of things I don't understand. But again, look at what that tornado did to Sandy's son and him escaping, uh, being caught up in the whirlwind, you know. So God's bringing judgment on these people. There's no crops. There's no... Then it says this, verse 8. Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Talk about Debbie Downer. <laughs> but in all seriousness, this woman's starving and her son is starving and she's, they're just trying to get enough to put in their stomach to give them the strength to die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Man, that's a word for giving right there. Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. We are told in one scripture not that we're not to give under compulsion. Hmm. Do you think that this woman wanted to make, get, make a bit of bread for him first? Be realistic. You think she jumped up and down and said, I've got barely enough here for me and my son, and this guy is asking me to feed him first. But somehow, she knew that what he was saying was from God. And whether she felt like it emotionally or not, she did it. And she got blessed. You know, there are things in the Bible, I think. Here's the way it comes down. When we love God, and we really love God, everything becomes effortless. Everything becomes effortless that he asks us to do. But if you think in the situation I was in for a bunch of years that I wanted to leave a male lover, that was hard because that was my area of, of sin. But in obedience, I, I did. And there was a lot of emotional tie-in. It was a mess. Or, if you think the alcoholic wants to leave the bottle, <laughs> or the drug addict, or any, anything that God asks us to do, uh, emotionally, we are not going to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but in love for God. And then once we surrender initially in any of these areas, it's difficult. But, by, but God says, what I've commanded you today is not too difficult for you. What I've commanded you is not too difficult. I like that verse because it says it can be difficult, but it's not too difficult. Not too difficult or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven, so they have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. It's not across the sea, so that you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it for us and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. No. The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you may obey it. So what I'm saying, whether it's you the Lord is speaking to or the widow of Zarephath, that the word of the Lord came to her and said, give first to my purposes. Give to this servant of God who was representing God and you'll be taken care of. Somebody said no one ever became poor from giving. Just doesn't happen. John Ron said this, only by giving are you able to receive more than you already have. I'm going to say that again because that, that's like a tongue twister. Only by giving can you receive more than you already have. I, I can't explain that. Okay. Proverbs 21, 25, and 26. And borrowing a little phrase that Rick spoke of earlier, I'm going to make this quick. <laughs> See, it's a phrase you learn. It's the first thing you learn in Ministry 101. Yeah. And now in closing, no. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 25, and 26. The sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. Proverbs 22, 9. A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. Now, people, here's what I'm not saying today. I'm not saying when we talk about giving that that th this is the way it works, that it's like we take our offering, whatever it is, and we put it in God's giant slot machine. That's something we can all understand here in Las Vegas, right? Put it in this slot, we're putting it, huh, yeah. And then we're gonna pull the handle and <laughs> out comes, you know, huh. in other words, give, give to get, you know. So I'm not saying that. And, I'm not saying give till it hurts either. But I am saying that God has laws in place. And these laws in place are exactly like the laws of thorough dynamics that makes a multi-ton plane be able to go down a runway and take off and stay in the air. There are laws, natural laws, and there are spiritual laws. And there's a law of reciprocity, which Rick shared that scripture a little earlier, but I'm going to say it again, read it again. It's like the law of gravity. Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, and as Rick said, shaken together. <laughs> Can't even keep my glasses on, I'm shaking Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It, and, and the King James says, shall men give into your bosom. That's where it will come from, other people. Years back, even when I was young, I was pretty good at giving. And I remember a friend of mine's uh, ex-husband had died suddenly down in Laughlin. I think he went with a group of friends and was drinking and I don't know what happened, but he fell off a dock, and they found his body down the river. He may have had a heart attack, I don't know. But his mother and sisters came from Minnesota, I think, and uh, had to get uh, rid of the things he had in his apartment. And they called me and asked if I wanted his clothes. Now, I used to see this guy from time to time. We didn't look like we were the same size. He was 20 years older than I was. You know... But I went over to this apartment, and there was a walk-in closet with two rows 
on each side of clothes. And there were slacks. He would like, he had his slacks taken in when he'd go to the store, he'd have them tailored. And then anytime he wore them, he had them dry cleaned. There were all these dry cleaning tags. And there were dress slacks from white to eggshell to beige to browns to blues to every kind of thing. Suits, a leather jacket that went to the knees, uh, shirts, everything was my number one, my taste. And then I put the clothes on and nothing had to be altered. I had a 31 year, a 31 year, 31 <laughs> inch waist. And this guy's clothes fit me and nobody could figure it out. God just took care of me. I had another time where I was saving up for carpet in my house. And I saved like uh, a couple thousand dollars. I wanted to re-carpet my house. And I went away uh, uh, on a vacation and I had somebody watch my house. And when I came back, he saw I had green shag carpet in this house in the 80s, which was now out. But I didn't mind it. But anyway, he, he saw this and he left me a check for $1,200 and said, I know you want new carpeting. Now, I don't know how he knew that. But with what I saved in that $1,200, I got my whole house carpeted. I didn't need one more penny. And, and I was cautious because I was in a business where sometimes I'd, I'd work and then I wouldn't be working. So I remember saying to God, God, I'm going to spend this money on the carpet, but please sustain me because I can't eat the carpet. <laughs> so we went down, I just got the place carpeted and we went down to do this job in Laughlin that was an eight week job. And it ended after five weeks, they ran out of money. Typical show business thing. So at three weeks, for three weeks, I'm not going to get paid, Sherry. You know what, those sort of things. So I came home. It was during the election of, of the first Bush. You know, George Bush the first, whatever. George H. Bush, W. Bush. By the way, speaking of uh, politics, did you know that Bill Clinton is writing a new book? It's going to be titled Sex Between the Bushes. <laughs> What is that? Well, I wanted to tell it to you again because I enjoyed hearing it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just remembered it was election day. I, I just put new carpeting in my house. I've exhausted my savings. And there's three weeks of work I don't have. And I, I remember saying, praying to God, God, I can't eat this carpet. You know. And like within two days, they called and they had us go up to Reno to this uh, Legends and Concert up there for, the, for three more weeks. And God just, you know, this, that's what God does when we just do what he tells us to do. Just a blessing, just a blessing. A couple more verses. There's a difference between owing and giving. When we talk about tithing next week, from what I see in scripture, we owe it. And 10% is nothing. It really is nothing. And if it disturbs you that, to think about, here's a, a, a certain amount I owe. It's like uh, when you pay your power bill, when you make your house payment, let's put it that way. You don't say, I just gave American Federal Union or whatever $1,200. No, you owe it. <laughs> and, and so there are things we owe God. We owe God praise. We owe God our lives. So I have no problem with saying, I owe it. But it feels like nothing. It's like trying to say, I owe my wife my, my love. That, I don't feel any indebtedness that I owe her reverence, respect, love, affection, taking care of, fixing her break, breakfast, as I promised on our wedding day, keeping her an apple crisp the rest of her life. <laughs> One of her favorite desserts. <laughs> so, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6, and 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves cheerful giver. There's a difference between here's what I owe you, God, and here's what I'm giving beyond what I owe. And I, I don't worry about that distinction in my life because I just know the blessing of obedience. Now, I mentioned in, earlier in the sermon 
that being out of work at 21, 22 and being taken to the movies was so humiliating and I, I just wanted to be a giver. And uh, I've been obedient to that thing of, of giving. And you know what? We can always come up in higher in everything we do in the Christian life. And I'm not saying I've arrived. I'll never say that because I haven't. And I could learn to give uh, more. But it's, it's such a blessing to be able to bless people. And sometimes it's to the missionary. Sometimes it's to that need of, a, of the couple that lost an eight-month-old baby and the heartbreak they're going through. But sometimes it's just taking people out, like I took the, all these pastors and their wives, out for pizza and, and game playing and to see the, just their enjoyment and, and joy. And I'll tell you, pastors are cheap people. They are really cheap. I, I've seen it, you know. <laughs> so I'm sure I don't fit in. <laughs> and maybe they grew up in you know, homes of, with other pastors and the money is tight and everything, but they need to loosen up, you know. <laughs> but I love that. It's just a great, great blessing. It's a great blessing when we take, take, we take our family out. I'm so thankful I'm at this time of life. I can do that, that I couldn't do when I was younger. Now, the, the Bible also says this in Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Uh, again, when we give, you don't always see immediate results. You don't always see immediate results of obedience, period, in the Lord. But it's always, God, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And the Bible promises will reap. Now we're almost ready to close. <laughs> I've told you other times, I tip fast food workers. I love that. I love pulling up to the drive-in at KFC. Sometimes I just get a large thing of coleslaw. It's four dollars and something. It's the most expensive coleslaw on the planet. But it's tasty. And, uh, and then I'll hand like two dollars into the, and they're always like shocked because so few people do it. And, and you know what it is? That $2 or a dollar or whatever is not going to do much for them. I remember one little girl, we were at McDonald's in um, Victorville on the way uh, here from California home one time. And we stopped just to get a, a cup of senior coffee. Please, people, be aware that you get a special price if you're a senior. Uh, there's got to be some advantages, you know. So anyway, we got our senior coffee and we gave this little girl behind the counter a dollar. Big deal, you know. And she just, oh, her little face lit up and she just said, oh, that, that just makes my day because I came in, I have a toothache today. And she was just, you know, it was such a blessing. And sometimes you don't get thanked at all, but that's okay. So, a couple more verses and we're closing. Tim, lock the door. Uh, <laughs> Matthew 10, 8, Jesus, sending out his disciples to minister, said this, freely you have received, freely give. Just, just be free and, and, and listen to the Lord's voice. Now, before we close, I love the play, uh, The Matchmaker or Hello, Dolly. And this is what Dolly Levi said. She said, my late husband Ephraim said, money, you should pardon the expression, is like manure. It should be spread around encouraging young things to grow. That's the whole essence of what we're talking about today. It should be spread around encouraging things to grow. Matthew 10, 42. We'll close with this. Jesus said, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Let's bow our heads and just ask God to just kind of allow what's been shared today to sink into our hearts. Lord, as we close our service today, I really I want to thank you for the blessing of worshiping singing these beautiful songs, Lord, this morning. I surrender all. Lord, we just have to keep huh, that before us all the time because we surrender and we take it back and we surrender and we take it back. And that's okay because you know we're just made out of dust. 
and you are patient with us and you started this work in us and you will bring it to completion. We're standing on holy ground. How good that is, God. We stand in you and that's holy ground. And Father, sometimes it's difficult for us to obey. Sometimes it's difficult for us, whether it's in the area of giving or in just some other area of things we should not do or things we should do. But Lord, we know that if we, could, if we could see you more clearly, if we could understand your love more, we would melt into just a puddle of obedience, if that makes any sense. <laughs> and so, Father, I pray just uh, wherever any of us are today, Lord, with the issue of, of giving from our finances, giving from our energy, giving in any area, Father, that uh, whatever areas have to be adjusted in our hearts and in our lives, I pray, Lord, make those adjustments. We, we want to be willing servants. We want to be givers. And we want the Four Seasons Church to make an impact in 2020 and in the days ahead that you have for this ministry. Lord, we love you. I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the extra sunlight today. And we ask your blessing on each one under this roof today. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. 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 amen.